This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, guys. Today, I got a very special guest on the podcast. He is the one and only Phil Robertson. So he is a professional hunter, businessman, and a reality TV star. He is the patriarch of the great American family, the Robertsons, and he is the founder of the company Duck Dynasty. He was featured prominently on one of the biggest reality TV shows ever, and that was Duck Dynasty. Also, he's the author of several best-selling books, including Happy, 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 Unfiltered, that's with a P-H-I-L in the middle, The Theft of America's Soul, and Jesus Politics. And today, we're going to see spending really a lot of our time focus on a new book that is out right now called Uncanceled, Finding Meaning and Peace in a Culture of Accusations, Shame, and Condemnation. So it's his brand new book. I was so happy to get an advanced copy of it and to read it before we did the interview. It's out. If you're listening to this right now, it is out this week. It is good to go. You're able to take it in. The thing with his books, his books are very simple. They get to the point. They're quick and easy reads, but he's getting into a very, very a pertinent topic to our modern time, and that's cancel culture. That's what the entire book is about. And as you can imagine in this interview, and if you've watched any interviews with Phil or listened to his podcast, this didn't go in any way, shape, or form the way that I thought it would, but then in a way it did. Because I prepared all these questions. I wanted to talk about all these different topics, but I'm like, I know Phil's just going to go and talk about whatever he wants to talk about, and I was ready for it. So we were going to spend some time talking about Duck Dynasty, the show. We didn't talk about the show basically at all. We didn't get into, you know, why the show came about and all those different things. We did get into his early life. We got into, you know, how he used to play college football, you know, what made him kind of get into duck hunting and, you know, professionally and making duck calls and those types of things. But we spent a ton of time talking about our modern culture. And to be honest with you guys, it was like living inside of Phil's head as he was giving a sermon. That's what this podcast was about. But towards the end, I asked him a question that was basically a continuation of the appearance that I made on his show, the unashamed podcast last summer, because we spent most of that time talking about masculinity and manhood within the church and those types of things. But I was able to ask him a question that was kind of in that vein. I really loved his answer to that, but guys, one of the best uh, uh, times that I've had on an interview because I just got to shut my mouth and watch this guy do his thing. He had the Bible sitting right there on his chair. If you're not watching the video of it, the Bible sitting right there on the chair. We did the interview basically right there in his living room. He's sitting in his chair that he normally sits in, uh, you know, from the show or any of the times that you've seen him. And we just chatted and he's opening up the Bible and he's just flipping to this story and flipping to that story and quoting scripture off the top of his head. It was such a fun conversation. I was really, really glad to be a part of it. I feel very, very lucky to have been a part of it. And I'm glad glad I can help bring that to you guys as well, but I'm not going to keep him from you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Phil Robertson, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Hey, good to be here, man. I'm glad to see you again. It's good to reconnect. And there are a lot of places that I could start this interview with you, uh, but we got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to hit a lot of different subjects. But just to give the audience a little bit of an idea, you were born and raised in Vivian, Louisiana. So describe for us what it was like growing up in rural northern Louisiana as a kid log cabin uh one man built it with a cross cut saw and an axe no bathtub no running water out of the sink uh the refrigerator was literally an ice box you go get a block of ice in town put the right. block of ice in there where you kept your milk your cheese so basically we lived uh we, we ate a lot of ducks and, and squirrels Life was good. We'd plant a little garden every year and uh, have some potatoes up under the house. So, uh, but life was good. It was a very simple life. Well, so talk to me a little bit about that because some people will hear you describe that and they're like, oh my gosh, you were living in squalor. I bet you were depressed. I bet you, you know, you were just downtrodden the entire time, but that wasn't what it was like for you. Oh, not at all. We were perfectly happy. We were poor, but no one ever said, I never heard anyone say, boy, we are really poor. No right. one ever said that. We were doing fine. We had plenty of uh, raised their own beef, killed our own hogs, had a smokehouse where you smoked the meat. So I was raised in the, if you had pulled up there in your vehicle mm. and looked around, you would have thought in the 1950s when I was a boy, I was born in 46 you would think it was 1850. 
it was it was just like except for the old beat up Ford car, it was just like the 1800s. My dad was old school, so it was like living in the 1800s instead of the 1900s. Yeah, and I think that's interesting for a lot of people. You hear some people that'll go on and do mission work, you know, in Africa or other places around the world, and a lot of these people don't have a lot of things, and yet they're incredibly happy and satisfied because people don't understand, like, you don't need a whole bunch of tech. You don't need a whole bunch of, you know, frilly things to make your life nice. It's comfortable for a lot of people. But the the cool thing about you as well is obviously you grew up as an outdoorsman, and we'll get more into that here in just a second, but you also grew up an athlete. So a lot of people may not know this about you, but you actually got a scholarship to go play football at Louisiana Tech in the late 19th. Sixties and famously, you were the starting quarterback over some guy that no one's ever heard of named Ter- Terry Bradshaw. So that was kind of a cool uh, feather you got in your cap. So, but my understanding, Phil, is that it was your love of duck hunting that kept you from really pursuing pro football after college. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, I s- sat Bradshaw down one day and I said, Bradshaw, I said, uh, you want to go play pro ball, play football, and I understand that. I said, unfortunately, I'm first string and you're second string. <laughs> right. so you haven't beaten me out yet. I said, well, I don't want to play pro ball. I said, I want to go to the woods and live a life in the woods. And I said, so I have one more year to play, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to step out and you're going to step up. And I said, good luck to you, but I'll be gone. I won't play next year. And he said, are you serious? I said, yes, I am. I heard him uh, not too long ago, a few years, a couple, two or three years ago, he made a comment and he said, I'll tell you one thing about that guy. He said he had a quicker release than I did. So Bradshaw had me a little bit on distance. I could take a step and throw a football about 65 yards, which is fine to, to go to the pro. Bradshaw, probably another five to 10 yards. He, he, he had a gun as, of an arm. I was a little quicker on the release, but 40 years after I told him that, you go play pro ball, I'm walking along in the airport in Los Angeles, and someone grabbed me from behind. I looked around. It was old Bradshaw. I said, <laughs> Bradshaw, you did well, man. Super Bowls. Or I said, you did great. He said, you did pretty good yourself in the woods, making duck calls and duck calls. So we both congratulated each other and rocked on. It's a great story, but, but it's true. Yeah, I think you both uh, made out and made the right career choices, but I really think that that springboards nicely into the early 70s, into the early 70s, because in 1972, you left your career as a coach. You were doing a little bit of coaching. You were doing a little bit of schooling there, and you wanted to pursue a career with duck hunting, okay? But specifically yeah. with making duck calls. Uh, so you founded Duck Commander, the company, in the, the next year, in 1973. So take us through the early days, because I, I think you kind of got into this because you were really dissatisfied with with a lot of the duck calls that were on the market, you, you made a comment. I think I remember where you're like, yeah, these duck calls would win a duck call competition, but you know, they're not going to call ducks properly. So take us through why you really want to shake up the duck call market. What I thought about is this, as a young boy living in the woods, I was very familiar and I became uh, very interested. Uh, I was into what, what birds sound like. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I said, you know, I said, these people build these duck calls. I said, you know, they're doing their Arkansas highball. And I said, I've never even heard a mallard duck do that. If a, <laughs> a duck can't even do that. So I started, and what I did was I not only built a mallard call, which is about all they had, mm. I built a gadwall call, I built a teal mm. call, I built a pintail call, a widgeon call. You, you see what I'm saying? Yep. In other words, I built the whole gamut, a wood duck. I built a wood duck call. So I just didn't build a mallard duck call and go to some contest. I built a variety of duck calls that sound like most of the ducks on these flyways. And as it turned out, the first year sales, by the way, $8,000. And I said, Miss Kay, we are rolling. She said, <laughs> we're right. going to starve to death. I said, no, we're not going to starve to death, honey. Wait till next year. It was about 13,000 the second year, then like 22,000, then 38,000, and then 60,000. And about year six or seven, we finally hit the $100,000 mark in sales. I said, we are really rolling now. 
what I didn't realize is about 2014, <coughs> and I started about, after about 30 years, I looked up one day and someone called. They said, come sign your one millionth duck call we've sold this year. So I went up there to the factory and I signed the duck call. And we sold that year 1.2 million. That's when Duck Dynasty was there. And right. I said, where are all these duck calls going? They, they, I'm selling more duck calls and they have duck hunters. And someone said, it's the women where most of the money always is. It's the women who are buying it for their children, for their sons or daughters. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what do you know? So it just, uh, it, it, it was like this. And, it, and now we probably sell 200,000 duck calls a year. So it's still going. But right. uh, it seems like a long way off now. But all I do now is, is I fear God and I do what's right. I share Jesus with, Jesus with people and I duck hunt. That's hey, why I said you. I think you've done good for yourself, and that doesn't take much uh, to fill up the calendar if those are the things that you're going to be focusing on. But it's a great story of business where you basically see a gap in the market, and you're like, I'm going to fill it because the you know they're they're making a generic you know pitch into this market. It's not and generic wasn't going to work, and so it's it's a testament to your decades of success that you're basically going after yep. what the market needs. But you kind of alluded to it a little bit there, Phil, and you know a lot has been made. You've written about this, you've spoken about this, you talk about it on your podcast. You had a pretty rough past. Uh, there were a lot of decisions that you made growing up uh, that I don't know if you uh, regret doing them because it's kind of springboarded you into what you're doing now, but you had a very sinful lifestyle. There were a lot of things that you did that you know, you're know you certainly not proud of. Take us through that rough past and then we can just crescendo right into your conversion to Christianity because you have the similar story to a lot of people. You were lost in a life of sin and that Jesus said no more and he snatched you out of it. So go any direction you want to with that. So I started out as a young man. I was trained uh, very well. Uh, my mom and dad both were very godly people. But uh, as they say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul told the Romans, and the wages of sin is death. So when I began to sin, I became a victim, and I was ensnared by the evil one. So he's got me by the throat. Now I'm I'm getting getting drunk, getting high, getting laid. Not necessarily in that order, but that was pretty well the the events I was the behavior I was participating in. At 28, so from about 18 to 28, Miss Kay and I, she was with me. She left high school and went with me to Louisiana Tech. I just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse until by the time I was 28, one day I looked around, I had run Miss K off, run the kids off. So I thought, I'm like a dog chasing his tail. And my, my little woman, Miss K said, won't you go talk to Bill Smith? He's a preacher and uh, just listen to what he has to say. So I did. And when he shared Jesus and the good news, God becoming flesh 2022 years ago, he said, by the way, we all count time by Jesus Christ. Mm. He's that big. Out of all the humanity who ever lived, our calendar is based on just one of them, Jesus Christ. He died on a cross when I saw that. And to remove all my sin, I had many. So I thought, you may need to be wiped clean. He said, wiped clean. And I, after he died, was raised from the dead, the resurrection there's life beyond planet Earth. Immortality is riding on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All he requires is you love him and you love your neighbor. I said, I think I can do that. Mm -hmm. oh, the old preacher said, trust God and try. You'll make some mistakes. Just remember, all your past sins have been removed. None of your future sins are counted against you because Jesus got us out from under the written code. And that's why I wrote the book, Uncanceled. Because when I saw Jesus canceled the written code, I'm like, whoo! And he brought us under a system called grace. It's a free gift. And when I saw that, I said, man, 
No wonder I, I would try to do good. I couldn't do good. It's like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. Listen to this. Here's the old, the old Apostle Paul, and this is a doozy. Watch this. Watch his logic. Let's see. Right here. Here's the Apostle Paul. And it's a, it is a doozy of a letter. Watch this. Uh, we know that the law is spiritual. Nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. Not, you know, uh, the children obey your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. I'm like, yeah, that would work. Unfortunately, right. the Apostle Paul is going to remind us that we didn't keep it. We can't keep it. Not one. Jesus shows up, he keeps it, and then gets us out from under it. You're like, whoo, watch. We know that the law is spiritual, sure, but I am unspiritual. That's where I was at 28. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Nothing wrong with the code, but there's a whole lot of wrong with me. Well, look where all that. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it. It's sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. That's why when you come to Jesus, your sinful nature is cut away. It's taken away. You're like, whoo. Let's see, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That's the way I was until I was 28. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That's an explanation of what you currently see in America because there's a mighty throng of individuals who are operating like I used to. Mm -hmm. But watch. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it. It's sin living in me that does it, the evil one. So I find this law at work. But I want to do good. Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're like, that's what happened to me at 28. And now looking back at it, I always give them the sinful part of my past up front because the cancel culture is going to find out about what you did probably anyway. Mm -hmm. And they look for mistakes you make, and they are unforgiving to the core of their being because they do the same things, yet they cancel others for doing what they all do. So absolutely, the wrath of God will be poured out on them. By the way, Romans chapter 2, if you want to just get a little update, on why I wrote this book. You have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. So it's just the cancer culture is a group of sinners that's looking up sins of others and they will never forgive you. Remember Jesus when he died, he, looked, he said, you know what? Uh, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. So Jesus keeps the law. Look what they did to him. 100% flawlessly perfect. Never violated the law. By the way, he wrote it. He wrote it and then kept it and then got us out from under it and put us under grace. What a wonderful thing Jesus did for us. So now I have life and immortality, and the whores are gone, and the drunkenness is gone. I haven't said a cuss word probably in 50 years. Someone said, can you ever clean your mouth up? I said, 
Oh, those are the easy ones. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, that's an easy one for sure. And, and the thing that's incredible about your story, Phil, and we'll certainly get more into the book here in just a second. Whenever I got to spend time with you at your home and in your studio last year when you had me on Unashamed, the, the thing that kept coming to mind is that you, sir, and, and your family, y'all are marinated in the gospel, marinated yeah. in the scripture. And, and one thing about you, and you've said this before, is there's a difference between studying the Bible so that you can memorize it, which is not a bad thing versus right. reading it so much that it just comes out of you, which this yep. wasn't exactly the plan, but I think this segues nicely into the new book, which again, thank you so much for sending me an advanced copy of this. It's uncanceled finding hey. meaning and peace in a culture of accusation, shame and condemnation or yeah, go ahead. Hop back in. Well, I would just go to remind the people who are listening. You want to hear something that's wild. Listen to this right here. You folks who are listening, uh, uh, am I dreaming or is this true? Let's see. Here's the Apostle Paul. By the way, blasphemer, the Apostle Paul, murderer, I mean, persecutor. He was arresting people, throwing them in prison. And Jesus said, I think I'm going to pay him a little visit, a personal visit. So he struck him down on a road going into Damascus. And he, who are you? He said, I'm the one you're persecuting. I got a job for you. He didn't even argue with Jesus. He told Timothy, watch this, mark this, meaning what I'm fixing to say, you might ought to take note of this very carefully. Mark this. Uh, there will be terrible times in the last days. Hebrews 1 says God worked through the, the prophets at many times in various ways in the past. But now he's spoken to us by his son. And he reminds us that we now have entered the era of the last days. And people better look, look out, too. There will be terrible times in the last days. Let's see if this, familiar, this is familiar. And let's see if the United States of America, a lot of people inside it, are guilty of this charge. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Just look at all our sons and daughters in the streets and on their looting, shooting, spray paint, F you on buildings. You're like, what in the world? Young people, they disobey their parents. They are ungrateful. You would think they would appreciate a free culture, but they just, they're unhappy. They're, right. they're belligerent. They're going around finding people and blaming them, getting them fired. They are unholy. They're without, without love. You say without love. What people don't realize is that we're living in some trying times because we've lost the ability or renounced the truth that God said, love me and love your neighbor. Those are the two greatest commands in the Bible. The apostle Paul is telling Timothy, these people in, in the last days, what it's going to look like. You mm -hmm. say, good night. The more you read in that list, the more it looks like we are sure enough in the last days. Well, what you're going to see is people without love. Check this next one. Unforgiving. They look up and they try to get somebody fired or they want people to, and they, you know, what? they're trying to ruin their life over and over. And you see it growing. Unforgiving. They came to Jesus. Peter said, Lord, how many times should we forgive someone who sins against us? Seven in America, you probably won't even get three strikes. Right. You probably call out on strike number one. You're like, why are they so quick to condemn? They are unforgiving. They don't know God. Therefore, he gives them over to a depraved mind. What we're seeing swirling all around us is depravity. Watch. They're unforgiving. They're slanderous. Huh. Without self-control, just the drugs. I mean, you're looking at them and you're like, what? 
what what these inner cities uh, i'm just saying even out here in the country we see the same things you see in the cities we're like come on without self-control they're brutal not lovers of the good they're treacherous rash conceited lovers of pleasure everything now you have to have women jumping up and down with their boobs flopping or you can't sell it and i'm looking at it i'm like all i want to do is watch a ball game for crying out loud and they put all this stuff in it lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god having a form of god in this but denying its power so when you look at it you say man Woo, that's Second Timothy chapter 3. There will be terrible times in the last days. I see them coming, don't you? Absolutely, Phil. And I mean, that's one of the great reasons why you did write this book, Uncanceled. Uh, and it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, in, in modern modernity, we get one strike, right? So you're you're right in the throes of Duck Dynasty. And back in December 18th of 2013, yep. your own network that broadcasted your show, A&E, announced that you were being suspended for the show, uh, from the show because of a GQ article that came out. In that interview, you paraphrased scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, talking yep. about don't be deceived, neither adulterers, neither the idolaters, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, the greedy, the drunkards, the slanderers, the slanderers, the swindlers, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. It's not right. And of course, those comments didn't go over well because you made other comments about questioning homosexual impulses, you know, rightfully condemning the lifestyle. And a &E suspended you 48 hours, 48 hours later, you're welcome back because of the uproar from your fans. And that was a really trying time for you. You mentioned in the book, it lost you what you called, you know, a cool $10 million, which we don't necessarily need to get into that. But I do want to key into something there because, Phil, that was your show. Uh, you were quoting scripture and it cost you. Right. And you yep. were doing this interview. Uh, you were doing it, uh, trying to be well-meaning and uh, upfront and honest with somebody. And your words were kind of taken out of context and context was added. But the interesting thing that you bring up in your book, and this is from very, very earlier in your in your book, it was in chapter one. You say cancel culture may be effective at forcing people into submission, but it does nothing to persuade. And I thought that was very critical to understanding what happened to you when you were kicked off your own show, because who was persuaded to change their mindset on homosexuality because of that situation? Was anybody? You know, everyone, it just kind of muddied the waters. But I want you to talk a little bit more about that situation with the GQ article that came out and how cancel culture is basically doing nothing to make things better. It's just making people more angry. Yeah, exactly. In other words, what I, what I didn't realize is when he asked me the question, he had just come from Jason and he, what the question he asked Jason before he got to me, well, you know, I'm seated over here in this same chair. Jason was seated at the end of that couch there and Jephthah, that other boy of mine was seated <laughs> next to him. I think Willie and Cy were over here. Well, I, I didn't even know who the guy was and I never heard of the magazine. I asked him, I said, what does GQ stand for? And when he walked in the door, they said, this is so-and-so with GQ magazine. I said, what's GQ stand for? Because I, I really didn't know. And he said, oh, you know what it is. I said, I have no idea what it Me is. Me neither. So what he said, it stands for Gentleman's Quarterly. Okay. I said, evidently, I'm not running with the gentleman that you are. But I didn't <laughs> know who, what kind of magazine it was. The question he asked Jace was, listen, first question out of his mouth. He said, do you actually, Jason, believe that we, that, that you didn't have sex with your girlfriend before you married her? You're trying to get us to believe that? Jay said, I don't care whether you believe it or not. That's what happened. Right. I waited till we married. He said, but I don't care if you believe it or not. He moved to Jephthah and Jephthah said, he asked him, now I don't know this is going on before he gets to me. Mm -hmm. He asked uh, Jephthah, he said, let's see, what did, how did he word that? He said, oh, yeah, he said, when did you start your uh, uh, sexual sins? How old were you? And Jephthah just looked at him and said, Phew. he just kind of gave him a, no, I'm not answering. Well, then he gets to me, do you believe homosexual behavior is a sin? I just thought I'd give him first Corinthians six, nine and 10 off the top of my head. Like you did. I just gave him the text because I thought if he wants to argue about that, he'd argue with God about it. 
This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. You know, don't be deceived, and the, and, and and all that goes with it. So ten sins are listed there. One of them's homosexual behavior. I figured that ought to do it. But what I didn't know was it was all a setup. So once they twisted it around, I kept watching the news, thinking, I wonder if someone's finally going to figure out it's a Bible verse. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it took three weeks. The news media and the cancel culture, whoever they are, it took them three weeks for someone to say, he just quoted a Bible verse that talks about that particular sin. And what they all left out was, is the final part of that. And that, with these sins, were what some of you were. You were like this, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. So the Apostle Paul was letting them know, look, you can come out of these sexual sins and this, you know, slanderers, swindlers. You can that all that can be wiped away, and you can be sanctified and set apart and justified. So they left that they conveniently left that little part out about Jesus could solve their problem. So to this day, but one of the reasons I did write the book, I just wanted them to look and see what we have here, my man, is a is a a loss of love for God and their fellow man. Check this out. First John chapter three. Dear friends, let us love one another. Remember, Jesus said greatest commands in the Bible. Love God and love your neighbor. Uh, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What the cancel culture do not understand, I, I sincerely love them. I'm trying to get them to come to Jesus so their sins can be removed and they can be raised from the dead for crying out loud. Right. I don't hate anybody on this earth. I love them. You say, well, did you ever come back on and get on television and try to answer all that, all that crap they were throwing out there on the, I said, no. You said, what about the people who fired you? A and E, uh, indefinite hiatus. And they, they told me, they said, well, it actually wasn't firing you. Uh, Mr. <laughs> we were just, Put you on a temporary hold. I said, "Yeah, tell me about it." I never. I said, "Y'all ever get an irate phone call from me?" They said, "No." I said, "Did I ever say anything negative about you at any time during these proceedings when all this stuff is going on TV?" I said, well, "Did I raise Cain?" He. They said, "You never said a word." Because what it is, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So I'm trying to get the cancel culture to stop going around ruining people's lives and go to their brothers and sisters, their fellow members of the human race with kindness and goodness and joy, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I'm wanting them to be that way instead of the way they currently are, because the evil one would be the only one that can make a hater out of you. You know, one. Romans chapter two, they're called, a lot of them were called the Apostle Paul, the only place in the Bible that's about uh, chapter one, about verse 28 and following. They, they are God haters. And that's the sad part in all this. When I think the thing is, Phil, that you brought up that was interesting is you talk about love, but in our modern culture, love supposedly means letting people do whatever they feel like doing. So a, a good buddy of mine, I had him uh, on my show and he's somewhere between atheist and agnostic. And finally, he wasn't rude about it, but he said, Kyle, why the F do you care if I believe in God or not? And I didn't know he was going to say that to me. So I was kind of caught off guard. And the only thing I could think to respond, Phil, was because I love you, brother. 
because I want you to have what I have. Because if we get to the end of our lives and we're just worm food and the lights get turned out, then it's yeah. no big deal. Like you were right. Guess what? We're both worm food. We don't exist anymore. But if there is everlasting life and if Jesus is our way to that salvation, I want you to have that. But that's not the world we live in right now. The world we live in right now is this is who I am. You have to accept me for who I am or you're a hater and you're a bigot. And that's exactly what cancel culture does. But Phil, one thing that I really like that you did in your book, which I was not expecting, because you did dip your toe a little bit into the political arena by making some yep. appearances with Donald Trump and yep. you know all that ha stuff happening around 2016 time period. But you had this quote from Uncanceled that I thought was great, and it was this. What those who call for deprogramming me don't realize about me is that I put zero hope in Donald Trump. I liked a lot of his policies, but Trump didn't die for me. He wasn't raised from the dead for me. I've met him several times and I found him to be a pretty nice guy in person. But one thing I know is that I could vote for him a thousand times and still be lost in my sins. He's just a man. Instead, all of my hope is in Jesus and he alone is capable of reprogramming me. That was my favorite quote from the entire book. And the reason was is because we all get wrapped around the axle with uh you know politics politics is not local anymore it's federal and we got to get our guy you know into the white house so that he can put our favorite people in the supreme court and so that all these other things can happen in our state houses and blah 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 on and on but people are forgetting the fact that they are a depraved sinful human being and if Trump had won in 2020, they're still a depraved, sinful human being, regardless of what they wanted to happen. Correct. But I guess, why did you decide to kind of go ahead and, you know, almost attack the the worship that we've created around our political figures? Well, I, I, I watched it unfold. And, and when he lost, I said, you know what? I'm just, uh, I'm tired of seeing the way this thing goes. Listen to this. This is uh, Romans 13, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding. Pay your bills. Except the continuing debt to love one another. The reason I wrote the book was to let the people know who tried to cancel me. I love you folks. I dearly do. The commandments... Whoever, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Just think about that. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the key. Verse 10. And I live by this because we all should. Therefore, love does no harm to its neighbor. Love does no harm. I, the cancel culture, that's all, that's all they do is harm. And they get after it. We got you. I'm saying, why don't we try our best to love one another? And I don't think you're going to be able to do it without faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm just present the case to one after the other. This one is in book form. I'm just trying to get them to at least investigate Jesus of Nazareth. But it's it's like pulling teeth. But what? it's been rough all the way since Jesus was here. Look what they did to him. Look what they did to all the apostles, the, the John. They, they, they killed him. They slaughtered him. So it, it's 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 bad now. But, but during the days of the Roman Empire, I, I'm sorry to say it was probably worse. But we're yeah, getting was, there. Yeah, it was definitely worse. Uh, there's, a, there's a great book that's on our book list on our website where it really details the first thousand years of Christian he uh, history. It's called Tried by Fire. And it's like, you are not being pulled apart by two separate animals. You're not being dragged down uh, you know, stone steps until you're bludgeoned to death. So I think things are they're bad, but they're not quite that bad. But one of the things, Phil, that I think you said, it's like pulling teeth, trying to get these people to love one another and to see Jesus. And, and I completely understand that and see that. Part of it is because truth and, and I mean, capital T truth is being attacked in our modern culture. And, and you actually brought this up in the book where you point out that the Cambridge Dictionary actually has an alternate definition of truth, which would be one of the easiest things in the world to define. But now it's yep. defined as a fact or principle that is thought to be true by most people. 
It's so thought to be true by most people suddenly makes something a statement of truth. But we live in this postmodern culture where you're not allowed to say something is true because if you say something is true, that means it's exclusive. And it's, if, if it's exclusive, then we can't have true equity, right? We can't have yeah. all these buzzword things. But from your perspective, is that the thing that's the most damning about our modern society? Is that truth in and of itself is being undermined? You are correct. Listen to this. Uh, if you hold to my teaching, Jesus said this to the Jews. They had gathered around him. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Just do what I say. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What's their, what's their answer? They answered, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone, which was a lie. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you're Abraham's children, descendants, yet you're ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. You're like, boy. That was written 2,000, right at it, 2,000 years ago. You're like, wait a minute. Uh, and you do what you've heard from your father. I'm telling you what I have seen in the father's presence, and you do what your father. You say, well, evidently, we have two fathers here. Well, 2,000 years later, let's see. Uh, if you were Abraham's children, you, you would do the things Abraham did, as it is. You're determined to kill me. That's twice he said that. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You're doing the things your own father does. That's twice he said, I have my father and you have a different father. Watch. We're not illegitimate children. They protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? And it's muddled 2,000 years later, too. Because you're unable to hear what I say. You, here's why they don't see the truth. You belong to your father, the devil. Now we've got him identified, their father. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer all the way back to Cain and Abel. He was a murderer from the beginning. Check this out. Not holding to the truth. He was a murderer not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. That's where all this is coming from, the source. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You're like, Jesus is putting the blame on the evil one. Yet, because I tell you the truth, that's about four times he's mentioned. You don't believe me. What's this? Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? He said, where have I gone? Where have I sinned? They're all sitting there listening to him. He said, that's how you can know where the truth is. Jesus never made a mistake. He is the truth. Right. And you reject him, you will never find it forevermore. You will never find it because the source of truth is Jesus Christ. So it's not like something like rocket science. He just tell them, if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So let's face it, unless you belong to God, there's not going to be any truth, and there's certainly not going to be any love. I would just think that I want them just to stop a minute and say, think about what y'all are doing and the way you're doing it. I mean, have you at least investigated the one you count time by? Jesus, at least just look into it right. and see what he said. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all told the same story. Someone said, well, why would God be so redundant and repeat himself 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, why does he have them given the same message, the same person, what was said, and what happened? Why would he do it four times? So they can't miss it. Right. You can't right. miss it. But Phil, you brought up something that's incredibly key, and it's investigating the truths of Jesus. Because whenever I talk to friends of mine that are that are honest seekers, you know, they get hung up on dinosaurs, and they get hung up on Jonah in the well, and they get hung up on Noah's Ark, they get hung up on these things, and all those things are important. Those things deserve investigation too. But I'm like, let's save ourselves some time here, and let's go to the person of Jesus, because there's no more certifiable fact from antiquity than Jesus, a Middle Eastern Jewish man, was condemned by his own people, the Jews was handed over to the Romans, was killed on a Roman cross. The Romans were batting a thousand for crucifixion. Nobody accidentally made it out alive. But you need to investigate whether or not you can believe that he rose on the third day. That is the thing that you need to base the entirety of your life off of, and then we can work out from there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's one thing for someone to say something, and, and possibly you won't believe it. But look, you get about the middle of Matthew in chapter 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You turn a page. That's Matthew chapter 16 in the middle of it. He hasn't said that up to now. So he brings it up. I turn one page. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he'll be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. You turn another page. Now I'm looking at Matthew chapter 20. We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. This is the third time. They will, I've said this. I've read this. They will condemn him to death will turn him over to the Gentiles, the Romans, to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be raised to life. So he begins to tell them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is what I'm going to do. It's one thing where somebody comes along and says, hey, uh, uh, let me just tell you all something. We're going up to Jerusalem, and I'm fixing to die. They're going to kill me, and in three days, I'll be raised from the dead. It's one thing to say something like that, but when someone says it repeatedly mm -hmm. and then does it, you better listen to him. Don't yeah, anyone that, him. anyone that can predict their own death and follow through with it, like that, that's a pretty good thing that you should probably base the rest of your life on as we do with time. You and and Phil, uh, one thing I wanted to make sure I got into with you is kind of a continuation of my time that I spent with you and Al down there in Louisiana on Unashamed. We talked about manhood and masculinity and specifically how that seems like it's a dichotomy from the godliness of the church. It seems like the manly men are off doing one thing and the godly men are inside the church doing their thing. Thing. That's a dichotomy of a lot of people. And actually, again, in Uncanceled, you sort of address that. So I want to read this quote here and then get you to give me a little bit more context on it. But this is from later on in the book. You say, you may have contemplated a question such as, what would I do if I were dragged before a federal court where the judge and jury were Christ haters and I was required to answer for my faith in Jesus? And then you go on to kind of describe, you know, if you're just culturally Christian, you won't stand up for Christ. But then you say this. To you, he was just a fair-haired man with long hair like the Jesus depicted in the paintings of the Renaissance. Your yep. Savior is just a lamb-petting nice guy. And I will tell you, that is one of the main reasons. That's There's a reason why there's a lion over my shoulder right now is because when people look at the Lamb of God and Lion of Judah, they ignore one completely and barely describe the other. And so they talk about the Lamb of God, but no one really likes to talk about the Lion of Judah. They don't like to talk about the Jesus that comes back in Revelation with a tattoo yep. in his leg and his robe dipped in blood and a sword in his mouth. And they, they don't want to talk about the fact that he cleared out the temple not once, but there's evidence that he cleared it out twice, a very yep. violent premeditated act. But for, for your from your perspective, you're considered by many, many to be a very manly guy, very typically manly. You like to hunt. You know, you're, you're into meat. You're into all those different things that a lot of guys are into, four-wheel drive trucks and mud and the whole nine yards and football. But why is there such a seeming dichotomy between manly men and godly men? The power of the evil one, the power of the evil one works in and through human beings. Check this out. Uh, 
here, here's a good thing to remember. Uh, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. For those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he'll give eternal life. For those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. God does no, not show favoritism. Manhood is flying away and if you're talking to a human being, and I've done it right here in this living room multiple times, and they're confused about, they don't even know whether they're a male or female. And I, and I, I talked to one guy, we converted him, and he said, you know, I was a woman for three years. And I said, I doubt it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but, but tell me your story. So he's, I said, why did you ever really say, I'm, I'm blowing smoke here. I'm lying my head off and claiming I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a female. He showed me a picture of himself when he was a female for three years, claiming to be. I said, why did you do that? Start looking like a woman. He said, because I had this voice in my head that said, you're really a woman. You're really a woman. You're really a woman. He said, Satan was whispering that in my ear. And he said, but I knew better. I said, so how did you get out of it? He said, I said, by the way, uh, if it's worth anything to you, you look better as a woman than you do a man, dude. I <laughs> said, but, but you're a man and, and get up in another get up. And I said, you know, they gave the medicine where he'd had the boobs, the whole thing. But he said, Phil, I was just listening to Satan whisper in my ear for that entire time. He said, I knew I was a man, born a man. He said, I was just telling a lie and I knew it. So when he finally got out Monday, we support him and all. So he's doing well. And uh, and I love him for doing that, for, for making the change. He had about 25, 26. He come out of all that stuff. Now he helps the kingdom by doing the work of the kingdom. So he's a good dude. That's an incredible story. And Phil, to, to be honest with you, I, I didn't plan to ask you about it, but you just kind of made me think about it. Every time you talk, seemingly, whether it's any episode of Unashamed or when you talk in person, you always have some sort of an anecdote like the one you just gave me about somebody that you and your family helped, you know, preach the gospel to and, and get them saved. You, you have countless stories of people driving up to your it's gated now, but driving up to your property and, you know, basically coming into the house, they dumping their life. Keep, they right? just keep coming. They keep they, coming. And you take them down to the Washita River and you baptize them uh, right then and there, or you baptize them wherever there's a body of water or a bathtub. And Phil, yeah. I just got to say, it's a challenge to to a guy like me that's so bold and so you know big in the things that I say and talk about that I have to make sure that the gospel is still at the center of those things because you're having a true impact for the kingdom just by living your life. You're not an evangelist by trade. You're, you're not paid to no. be a professional Christian because you work at a church or something like that. You're no. just a dude. But talk to me a little bit about that. Is it not kind of crazy to you that, you know, however many times a year, dozens of times, if not hundreds of times, you're putting your hands on somebody and dumping them under the water and, you know, as a symbol of them, you know, having their sins washed away. What an incredible life that you're leading in that way. Yeah. Well, uh, Jesus said it, and it's simple but profound. When, when in Matthew, he said, all authority, this is after his resurrection, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to me. I just died and stayed dead for three days, and I'm back. I'm paraphrasing it. I'm back alive. They couldn't kill me and get away with it. I'm, I'm still here. Therefore, I mean, you want to talk about authority. I said, man, he just beat death for me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I will be with you to the end of the age. It's simple. It's direct. This is what you do. Therefore, for all the ones to go to the church buildings every week, if all you ever get is a couple of hours one day a week and someone else is doing the talking and you're just seated on a pew, if that's all you get, you need to get up. Get up and on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday before I come back up here to this structure and go in and sit on the pew, I need to be actively involved in making disciples in some form. Because if you don't, this thing can overwhelm us because we're not offering our bodies as sacrifices, which is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies. That Romans 12, check this out, which that was a great question you had. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is all the time, 24-7, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't run with them. Be separate. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our work for the, for the kingdom is, starts in here. And we act upon it. And check this out. You say, so there's a love problem? Watch what the Apostle Paul says in this chapter. Romans 12. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what's good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. This is all the time. Honor one another about yourselves, above yourselves, all the time. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. What you were explaining to the audience, you say, you seem to be at this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You, 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 Sunday morning to you is, I just go up there and say a few words, free of charge. I just go up there and give them a lesson. I will say that we, we, we uh, converted some law enforcement people who were working as my bodyguards, and they heard the gospel, so I baptized them. And one of them came up to me when we first started over there, where we are, little place next to the college over there. And he said, Robinson, I don't want to hurt your feelings. He said, but we've arrested about two-thirds of your congregation at one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, those are good words, man. We're trying to, do some, trying to help you all out a little bit. That's Keep right. your spiritual fervor, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Just look at what this is covering. This is all the time. Faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need. Watch this. Practice hospitality. If you start adding up and think you're, if you begin to add it up on how much it's costing you to practice hospitality, you won't do it. You, it's, it's expensive, but you're doing it for others. Bless those who persecute you all the time. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Just think about the cancel culture. Even seeing a group of individuals that all they want to do is live in harmony with you. We're t telling them, come on, don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. You're like, boy, we need to put that in practice all the time. Don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. Just love them. Right. Them I, slack. Let it go. That's why the cancel culture needs to understand. I love be, them. I don't hate them. It would be great if they could uh, hear those words and actually apply them. Uh, last question of the day, because I know you have uh, some duck hunting you got to get taken care of here in just a second. But last question. If you look back on your life, even now, because you talk about it a lot, you're in your mid seventies, you, you know that uh, for you there, you don't have uh, as much time as maybe your sons or grandkids do, or those types of things. You've said it a bunch. There's a lot of things that you could be known for. 
You could be known for starting duck commander. You could be known for being a professional hunter. You could be known for being a college quarterback. You could be known for being a New York times bestselling author. You can be known for a lot of things. And I think I have a pretty good idea of what you're going to say, but when your time here on this planet is done, Phil, what do you want Phil Robertson to be known for? Jesus. Number one, Jesus. Number one. That's all I would hope so they would say. Well, the old guy finally gone, you know, the old duck hunter, you know. What uh, What's that written on his tombstone? It just says Jesus number one. Absolutely. Hey, uh, that is a great message for all of us, uh, regardless of uh, the work we're doing, regardless of the life we're trying to build for ourselves or for our families. If you don't have Jesus, you are absolutely, completely lost. But Phil, I really appreciate your time today, but that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, nope, that a pretty well covered. All right, Phil Robertson, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. You bet you. I love you, man. I appreciate you. Love you too. There you go, guys. Man, that was a fun one. I had a lot of fun with that one. I'm glad that guy uh, came on the show and that we were able to kind of chat about the things we chatted about. Lots and lots of fun. But guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got a lot of Phil-related links for you here in the show notes. So we've got Phil's website. We've got a link directly to Thomas Nelson, which is the publisher that's putting out Uncanceled. So you can go there and check out the ways that you can buy the new book. Also, I've got links to Phil's YouTube channel, his book book webpage there on Amazon, his Substack because they're getting into Substack now, and also that GQ article, which is basically the center point of the brand new book. And that's the article called What the Duck. So there you go. Those are all the links for you. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. You can also follow us on Instagram and TikTok and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And we also want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.